The annual virtual rainbow brings together LGBTQ plus youth and their families, healthcare providers, community members, and other professionals to learn about and celebrate diversity and inclusion. Thank you for joining everyone and welcome. We are, um, we're ready to go. Welcome everybody back to the summit after that nice two hour break. I hope you're all refreshed and um, welcome back to Building Resilience for LGBTQ plus youth uh, with Jessica Sprain and Joan Sprain. And um, Jessica is the UF IFAS Extension 4-H Youth Development Agent in Osceola County, Florida, and her work focuses on STEM education, youth development, volunteer development, and diversity and inclusion targeting LGBTQ plus youth. Um, Joan Sprain is a retired professor and family living educator from the University of Wisconsin Extension and the University of Minnesota, where she worked for 40 years throughout both states with rural and urban audiences. And you can read much more about both Joan and Jessica on our website. So Joan and Jessica, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'll say this evening from the Florida standpoint, since it is officially 6 p.m. Uh, so thank you for joining us. So as you guys do join us, please, if you can, answer the following questions in the chat box. Um, if you can share with us kind of what your role is, are you a youth, student, parent, professional, or educator? And have you heard of adverse childhood experiences? And this is just for us to kind of gather who we have in our audience today so we can kind of address and change our presentation as we go. Okay, so we're getting lots of professionals, lots of yeses, which is good. So that means that our brief coverage of adverse childhood experiences will be sufficient for what we're going to do into. Okay, wonderful. So we'll get started as you guys continue to enter your information into the chat. There we go. So again, welcome to Building Resilience for LGBTQ plus youth. Uh, my name is Jessica Sprain. I am a 4-H extension agent with UF IFAS Extension. And I am Joanne Sprain. I am retired, happily living in Florida near my daughter. Um, I, as mentioned earlier, I work for the University of Wisconsin and the University of Minnesota Extension. My primary job was parent education, family living, um, community collaborations around the whole issue of resilience and protective factors. Um, I have to admit, I, as a parent educator and as a community collaborator, we never addressed um, resilience for LGBTQ youth. Um, unfortunately, it was because it was a political topic and I do regret that. So I am glad I had this opportunity to join with Jess. And if you haven't guessed already, we are related. We are mother and daughter. So Joanne is my mother. I know she looks so young, so you probably couldn't. Oh, yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so Joanne is my mother. And we're both very passionate about this topic. First, because she is a parent of a lesbian child. So me, so I'm an adult now. Um, and so she got to experience a lot of what I went through as a youth as I was growing up. Um, and specifically for me, because I work within 4-H and work with youth, uh, this is a audience that I'm very passionate about supporting um, and helping kind of build that resilience. And I was told that I needed to speak about the fact that this will be kind of the focus of my um, master's project as I move forward with my degree. Joanne wanted to make sure I said that. <laughs> so today's learning goals, we're going to cover adverse childhood experiences, kind of what they are, their prevalence, and their impacts on health. We're also going to cover the power of resilience and protective factors, and then specifically how to build and promote protective factors. 
We're going to briefly look at the uh, foundation uh, for our presentation, which is Adverse Childhood Experiences or ACEs. And many of you have identified that you know about this um, already. The first time I heard about it, I was in between my extension jobs, I was working for Prevent Child Abuse Minnesota. And our director um, who had lost a lot of weight said, everybody, you have to look at this study. This is like 20, almost 20 years ago. And what I found out about the study is originally they were looking at uh, people who had lost a lot of weight and then re regained the weight. And so we studied it as an organization. And um, then as I moved on to extension, I, I also looked at uh, using adverse childhood experiences in the work I did, especially in the criminal justice field. Adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood that can have a negative lasting effect on health and well being. Originally, the, um, Dr. Folletti saw patterns um, in his, with his patients that he worked with. And so he started doing interviews and he found out that abuse was a, a factor, especially with people who had gained a lot of weight back after losing a lot of weight. He joined with Dr. Anda and from the CDC. And um, what they determined to look at were seven different categories around abuse, neglect, and household characteristics. So abuse includes all types of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, emotional neglect, physical neglect, um, household, a house, having a household member uh, with mental illness. Um, a member that was incarcerated, parents who were divorced or separated, um, where mother was treated violently, or a household abuse, a member of a household of the household who had a substance abuse um, addiction. This was really important to me working in Wisconsin, which has the highest rate of um, alcohol abuse per population. And I won't get into the details of why that is. So move on, please. Next. Um, when looking in the, at this, it's really important to look at how common ACEs are. And if you look at this chart, uh, only 36% of people in this study, and this is a Kaiser Permanente study that Robert Anda and Dr. Folletti did. Um, it was with primarily um, people who had health insurance, first of all or access to health insurance. Um, they were pretty middle income, pretty Caucasian. And there were only 36%, a third, about a third, who um, didn't have any ACEs. That meant there were 64% that had one or more ACEs. So it's pretty prevalent. And Jess will talk next about specifically the LGBTQ um, population and how many ACEs they have experienced. So when we drill down more into a specific targeted population, so in this case, LGBTQ population, uh, there was a, a lot of, not a ton of research, but some research that's been done that shows that compared to straight counterparts, lesbian, gay, and bisexual individuals generally report um, a disproportionately higher prevalence of ACEs. They're more likely to experience patterns of abu abuse, um, which many of us, I'm, as professionals have seen this, along with high rates of psychological and or physical abuse and poly victimization. So then compared to their cisgender counterparts, specifically transgender and questioning adolescents report, or they're more likely to have experienced or experience poly victimization, psychological and or physical abuse, and there's more experiences of victimization overall. And these things lead to what we call toxic stress. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about toxic stress here in a minute, um, but I do want to show you kind of a visualization of the data that has been found specifically for the LGBTQ population. So um, this is obviously specifically just for lesbian, gay, and bisexual communities, but this is the comparison between heterosexuals and then the LGBT or the lesbian, gay, bisexual community. So within the heterosexual population, um, what was found was that 25.3% generally report four or more ACEs. 
Now, when we look at the lesbian, gay, and bisexual population, now we're looking at 41.6 that report four or more. But also I want you guys to take a peek at the fact that um, when we're looking at the heterosexual population, we're looking at 38.8% who have only experienced one ACE compared to those in um, the lesbian, gay, bisexual population of this study where we're looking at 25.5%. So that number does decrease, but however, we see that there are more ACEs overall um, within this community. So this is just kind of a great, great visual example of the impact of adverse childhood experiences. So this is what we call the ACE pyramid. And what we've kind of talked about so far is this um, level right here called adverse childhood experiences. But one thing that as they've done more research and dug into the effects of adverse childhood experiences, um, they're starting to learn more about social conditions such as poverty, um, violence, the community in which one grows up in. Um, so there's, we call those expanded ACEs. And then if we move to the bottom of our pyramid, there's more research being done too when looking at historical trauma. So racism, discrimination, and the impacts that that ultimately has on development. So as we look at these three levels, um, they lead to disrupted neurodevelopment, um, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. And then we look at that adoption of health risk behavior. And we'll talk a little bit about the impact of ACEs on health here in a second. Um, and it'll lead to kind of that disease, disability, social problems, and potentially early death. So this is why it's such an important topic to be looking at. Um, because as we're increasing and in looking at our adverse childhood experiences, kind of the social conditions in which our youth are growing in, growing up in, in historical trauma, and we're starting to see higher rates of disease, disability, and social problems and really leading to that early death. So how do ACEs impact adult health? The categories that Folletti and Anda looked at were measured with adult risk behaviors and compared to health status and disease. Um, and, and they have expanded this, so it, it includes even things like poverty. Um, this was kind of the proof. It, a lot is a professional. I saw this, especially with a lot of the families that I worked with um, that I did financial management with and the, the people in the, the justice system. But there was a strong relationship uh, to their health, social and behavior problems, uh, risky behaviors, substance abuse, um, mental health issues, tobacco use, heart disease can lead to heart disease, cancer, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, which we often don't think of, um, violence or being a victim of violence, um, suicide, early death, like the pyramid showed, and just a negative impact on their education, job opportunities and earning potential. For me, this again, this is things that we suspected as professions, professionals in my generation, but this was the proof that this actually did lead to um, adult health problems. Also, it, it really depends on how often it, the adversity happens. Uh, we call this a dosage effect. It, it's, you know, if you're sexually abused once, it, it's horrible, it, it ha will have an effect on your life. But if it's repeated and it happens over and over again, or, um, or if you have, let's say, a functional alcoholic in your family versus an, a, an alcoholic who can't work, who has, you know, just um, is so, um, addicted that that is not functioning at all. So again, the more ACEs, the more often it happens, uh, the greater risk or the um, negative health, come, health outcomes. So I'm gonna show you guys, or we're gonna go through this video and this video specifically talks about the biology of toxic stress. Now this is a clip from the film Resilience, which many of you who have uh, any experience with ACEs have seen this film. 
Um, this specific scene is really important, at least to me. This was the part where everything started to make sense. Um, but all of those factors, all of those adverse childhood experiences that our youth are experiencing are leading to um, different stress responses in our body. And what they'll kind of explain in this video is the stress responses are continuously being used, being turned on. And so there's no way to really get away from that stress. And that's where we get into what we call toxic stress. Just before you go ahead, someone asked a reminder for, for what ACEs means or stands for um, in the chat. And it's adverse childhood experiences. So it's something that it, you can have adult adverse child or adverse experiences too, but this ACEs specifically refers to things like abuse, um, divorce, negative um, experiences that can impact health in the future. I hope that helps. Perfect. Thank you, Duran. As I show this clip, if you guys can kind of think about, they'll go through and show an image of, you know, trucks coming at this individual. But I want you to think about are these trucks being um, things that our LGBTQ youth deal with on a daily basis. So for example, social stigma, um, just trying to function, discrimination, things like that, that our youth are consistently and constantly dealing with. Um, one example that I would like to share as, as being a cisgender female um, who is also a lesbian, I can pass through society relatively easily. Um, I can share who I, my gender, um, my gender expression matches um, my biological sex. So it's easier for me to kind of function through life than it is um, for my friend who's trans male. For him, he has to, at least when he was transitioning, it's easier for him now since he passes more in society. But for him, it was always a challenge every day just to select what restroom to go to when he was in public. Um, there was always fears of being um, bullied, you know, beat up, et cetera, if he entered the wrong restroom. There are always questions of why is this male individual in the female restroom? Do I need to be aware of my children? Um, he always had to deal with that and deal with the looks from individuals, the comments that were said, children asking their parents, is that person, a, you know, is he a boy or is this person a boy or a girl? you know, those kind of things. And so those are things that consistently um, our LGBTQ youth experience daily. Uh, many of you have probably experienced that or as professionals have seen youth or have seen friends deal with this. So I want you to kind of think about that as we go through this video and look at toxic stress. Were you guys getting any audio? No, Jess. No. Sounds good. Let me no, take it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm fix it. I think Danny's in the room. Yes, he is. Okay. Now. Danny, do you have any quick suggestions? Yeah, I think the best option is going to be um, if you can unstop sharing for a little bit and then try it again. This time, kind of keeping it out through the audio and seeing if that works. Out of there, and adrenaline and cortisol are going to help us do that. There it so is. If we can restart, that'd be great. Good amount of stress. But if all day long you're feeling like a truck is coming. 
Now I'm challenging to or having a challenge to get to the beginning. Sorry, team. Let's see, we're going to uh, let's see. We'll start from right here. Coming at you day after day after day, that's going to take a toll on the body. And uh, the amygdala, obviously, here is has greater activation yes. in the PTSD. We were able to image children that had experienced trauma and compare those brain images with children that didn't have an experience of trauma, didn't have symptoms. Right, an exaggerated fear response. An exaggerated fear response. With decreased activation in areas that we need to control that emotion in the frontal areas. Exposure to early adversity and trauma literally affects the structure and function of children's developing brains. So the kid next to them hits them or the teacher reprimands them in a way that uh, they're uncomfortable with, right? Literally what they're feeling, that activation, is like there was a truck coming at them. You can give something that will mask symptoms. Right? For example, if someone has a cough, right, you can give them a really strong cough serum that will suppress their cough. But if it's because they have tuberculosis or lung cancer, then what you're doing is merely masking the symptoms while the disease process continues to fester. We know what's happening in children's brains and bodies with the experience of toxic stress. So the question now is, what do we do about it? And that is the question we're going to answer. One of the ways that the um, impact of ACEs um, can be reduced is to look at the whole issue of resilience and youth protective factors, which I know a lot of you are pretty familiar with, um, but we'd like to highlight the ones that we think particularly work well. Um, one thing I wanna say is this is the piece that as I've worked with people and talked about ACEs with clientele, um, it's especially when I used to do jail programming and I talk about, but, but your children do not have to go through the same things you went through. Um, and we talk about resilience and protective factors. It was like, finally, there is hope. And so it's a really important message uh, that I feel that, that parents especially need to hear. Resiliency, and I use Dr. Garmazy, and the, the re, he is the founder of the whole resiliency movement. The reason I use him is he was at the University of Minnesota. And when I was on maternity leave with Jess, um, they asked me to come back because they wanted me to not miss hearing him. And I'm so glad I, I did hear him. Um, this is like from 30 years ago. Um, he defined resiliency as not necessarily impervious to stress. Not that you don't feel the stress, but the resilience is designed to reflect the capacity of recovery and maintain adaptive behavior um, that may follow an initial retreat or incapacity upon initiating a stressful event. It includes um, key elements such as the individual's um, temperament, uh, positive responses to others and cognitive skills. This includes like, like being smart in school or, or, or having a lot of common sense or um, being funny um, even being a people pleaser, which sometimes isn't seen as a negative if it's taken too far, but a people pleaser, a student that's a people pleaser probably gets along better in school than, um, or with teachers than one that isn't. Um, family factors, family cohesion, warmth, concern for all family members, um, love and positive um, affection, and that includes extended family. And then of course the support factors external to the family itself. It's like the ecological model, the family or, or human ecological model, if you're familiar with that. Next. Protective factors, um, and 
just builds on what Garmazy said, um, are proactive factors that buffer against risk of otherwise adverse circumstances by reducing the impact or changing the way a young person responds to it. It mitigates it or sometimes eliminates a risk. Um, again, examples are family attachment, school opportunities that are positive, individual peer social skills, emotional control, that executive function, and community opportunities for involvement and exposure to positive youth development programs, which for those of you who work for 4-H, that is one uh, program that I would say is a positive youth development program. Okay, Jess. So these are just specific youth protective factors. Um, these were defined by the Center of the Study of Social Policy, specifically through their Youth Thrive um, model and framework. So a few specific youth protective factors include youth resilience, social connections, knowledge of adolescent development, so it's actually knowledge of themselves, uh, concrete support in times of need, cognitive and, some, and then social emotional competence. And so what we're going to cover next is how do we um, as adults help strengthen and implement these protective factors for youth based on those um, that were just identified by youth, the Youth Thrive Framework. I won't spend as much time on parents and families, um, although it is the area of I've had the most interest in. Um, I'll just highlight a few of these. Um, it's really important for parents to accept their child in an affirming way, um, to find supportive organizations for themselves, um, to, to, to connect with other parents um, of LGBTQ youth, um, include, increase their own knowledge of youth development, especially brain development. Uh, when I used to do a positive parenting of teens class, which did not have, did not address sexual orientation at all. Um, but we did talk about brain development and adolescence is a, a time of rapid brain development, just like when we talk about brain development with two years, two year olds. Um, we also suggest that parents increase, uh, give opportunities to learn life skills. Um, things like goal development, help them identify goals and help then help them reach goals. This is true for all parents, but especially LGBTQ. Listen and be there for your child um, in times of need. Um, seek help yourself if you need, you need it or seek help for your child. Help navigate the service systems. I remember one time um, going to a doctor um, and the doctor asked some personal questions um, of my daughter and she never had a clue that my daughter could be a lesbian, um, which was really significant to the questions she was asking. I won't go into great details, but, but if the, the system didn't even see that as a possibility. Um, and this was in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. So we're not talking some rural doctor. Um, it's important to be an advocate. Parents need to be an advocate. I will tell you that as a retired person and I'm not connected with any organization where I have to act a certain way anymore. Um, I do this on Facebook um, in my 55 plus community. I am out, if somebody makes some comment, I'm right there to say something and certainly legislatively and parents can, can do that too. Um, just as they socialize with other people, they don't have to feel shame um, because their child is LGBTQ. It's also important for parents to help children develop um, things like executive function skills, problem solving skills, character strengths, responsibility, uh, making sure they follow through and just supporting who they are, that self-awareness, self-esteem, all the self, self-efficacy and self-compassion. The other thing is really to find parenting resources online. Um, there are not a lot of parent education resources that I'm familiar with that really have addressed this. I think there are a lot more being developed, but certainly the, the general ones through the Christian community, um, some Christian communities and um, general parent education programs um, don't do it. And you really need to do some more research. Yes. 
Okay, so this will primarily apply to a lot of you who are joining us this evening. I'm specifically looking at professionals, educators, and organizations. And as I go through this list, there are many, many things, and if not all of these things, are things that we already do as professionals, educators, or that we have in our organizations. Um, many of you identify that you are with 4-H. Um, these are things that we do within our 4-H youth development programs. The reason we're sharing these and tying these specifically to some of these protective factors is to affirm that what we are doing as professionals, educators, and those tied to organizations are doing what we need to be doing to help build resilience and support our youth. So just a few, a couple of things that are as professionals, educators, and being a part of organizations can do can really build trusting relationships with youth. So really build those social connections. And this would be listen in a non-judgmental manner, be dependable, and promote high expectations with developmentally appropriate limits and rules. A lot of times what ends up happening is when we see youth who are really going through struggles, um, we end up changing expectations for them. Now there's a certain way to be supportive um, and to adapt certain things, but still always make sure that we have those high expectations for them. Uh, provide emotional support and promote meaningful interactions in a context of mutual trust, respect, and appreciation. And this is really important, and we see this a lot within the 4-H Youth Development Program, is that youth-adult partnership. It's not, you know, we try and break down kind of the hierarchical order of the, you know, the adults you know, has power over the youth, et cetera, but really bringing everybody down to the same level where you can really get that mutual trust, respect, and appreciation. And really looking at most of the protective factor research that's out there, and we even see this within our 4-H youth development research, is the, the biggest part um, within helping youth kind of build resilience and those protective factors is having that key relationship with an adult, a caring adult. And this doesn't necessarily have to be a family member, um, a lot of the times it, it, there's a huge strength to having it be someone who's outside of their family. And so this is a really good thing for those of us who work with volunteers who work with youth to know that these volunteers truly can and are making a difference in the lives of the youth that they work with. So a couple other things are to provide environments that are safe, stable, and equitable. Um, the key thing that most of us understand what a safe and stable environment is, but really starting to dig into that equi equitable environment. Uh, there's a, a lot of things um, that we need to be addressing uh, historically, at least within my experience, specifically with 4-H, we have a tendency to look at um, equality. So we set rules that are the same across the board for everyone involved. Um, and then we expect everyone else, everyone to live up to those standards. Well, sometimes there are barriers that stand in the way that won't allow families or youth to reach our standards. And so to really be looking at um, what is equity and what is equitable in our programs are really important. Another thing is to train volunteers and staff on youth development and developing strong relationships and then applying this knowledge within the program. Um, again, this is really important because as we've seen for kind of the most important protective factor here is that key relationship with an adult. And so we want to make sure that our, the adults who are working with youth understand youth development and really understand how to develop those strong relationships. And then also conduct activities that build executive functioning, positive emotions, personal agency, sense of self and character strength. So this is more of the cognitive and social emotional competence. Uh, this also, you know, we can be helping our youth learn skills on how to deal with stress. That's another component um, as they're, you know, we will all face stress. We all face stress on a daily um, basis, but how do we use some of those skills, those tools to help decrease the emotions that we're feeling. The other thing is to help youth and families navigate service systems. As professionals and educators, we do have a lot of knowledge and we have a lot of partnerships with those in our community. So sometimes we are able to see a bigger picture than um, potentially some of our parents, families, and youth because we do get to work and build those partnerships across the community. So really be there to kind of help 
youth and families navigate through different systems and different um, opportunities that are present for them. And also to develop policies and procedures that acknowledge the prevalence of ACEs and trauma. And this is what we're seeing a lot in programs across the nation, um, especially youth development programs, really looking at thriving. For those of you who are in 4-H, there's a lot of discussion about the Youth Thrive model um, that 4-H nationally is working on adopting. And that is looking at, there is a huge prevalence as we discussed before, of ACEs with youth and even higher with youth um, who identify as LGBTQ. And so being aware of those ACEs and what these youth are going through potentially every day and the trauma that they're experiencing, we need to be aware of our policies and procedures that we have um, that could either make things worse or create barriers for them. And so one caveat I will say is for more, most organizations, we're not going to ask the question, are you dealing with trauma? What are you going through? We're just going to make the assumption that most of the people that we work with are going through something. And now if you're working for a counseling center, et cetera, then you're able to obviously dig into the, more of the specifics, um, but most organizations should not um, dig into specifically what's going on. Um, but should just make the assumption that a good portion of our youth especially are going through something at home or an adversity. So that'll lead us into just kind of an activity. And this is something you guys can either choose to type in the chat box or unmute yourself, or feel free to just take notes and think for yourself, um, to yourself, I should say. But just kind of think through what are some of the things that you currently do or can do to build resilience and protective factors with those around you to decrease the impact of ACEs. So if you're a parent, um, kind of think through some of the things that we discussed. If you're a student, what are some things that you can help educate yourself on or what are some um, additional supports that you would like to reach out to you know, to help build those protective factors for yourself or if you're a professional or an educator, make sure, like think about some of the things that maybe you can adapt in your program or different places that you maybe wanna learn a little bit more so you can help support those around you. So again, feel free, um, we'll leave it open for just a few minutes to type in the chat or to unmute yourself and share. And while we're waiting, Peter, oh, go ahead, Peter. I, I, I'm just easier than, than typing. Prior to working for 4-H, I, I worked for a school district and I was a nonviolent crisis intervention specialist. And I also trained teachers on, um, on ACEs. And <clears throat> one of the things that I would, I would always work when working with teachers is what you said there is making the assumption. If you don't know a child's story, make it up, make it as bad as you possibly can and then treat the child the way that you would want to be treated if that was your story. Um, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to be able to help them and to be able to support them and interact with them until you do know their story. You know, so when you have that, that one young person who's, who's acting out during, during a meeting, um, don't just assume that's a bad child. Assume that that child has something going on in, its, in, in his or her life that is, that's causing them to act the way that they are, you know? Um, so I, th I think that's that's a really great point that you brought up there. Jess and I did a, a, another presentation, actually it was just for extension, um, looking at, at ACEs and applying it to our extension clientele and Jess made the same point um, that just assume that our clientele has gone through something. And we did get some feedback that, well, it wasn't toxic stress. It was, you know, most people didn't have toxic stress. And we said, we don't know that. And so we just need to assume that people are dealing with things that might be ACEs and to create our programs that can support them in reaching whatever goal they wanna reach. I put in the comment that that also empathy. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, people when you ask them to define empathy, they come at empathy as 
oh, that's feeling sorry for somebody. Yeah. And empathy yeah. is not feeling sorry for somebody. Empathy is understanding why, how a person feels and why they're feeling that way, you know? And that takes, that's, that's a much higher level than just, oh, I feel sorry for you, Yeah. you know? And to be able to, to look at a person and see how they're acting and, and think about, you know, what's causing that for them, even if you've never been in those shoes, but to understand that. And one thing just off of what Peter had shared, there's been a big transition and the kind of the terminology is having more of a trauma-informed approach. And really it boils down to having empathy and considering you, you know everyone is human. Um, but the change in conversation goes from what's wrong with you to what are you going through? So it changes the whole entire perspective, just like what Peter was saying, a behavior isn't what's wrong with you. It's what's going on below the surface to cause this behavior. And so that is that is the kind of the biggest key. And while we're looking at kind of trauma-informed programming is a technical term out there. But And Anna, thank you for sharing the chat. I love providing a check-in time during mentoring programs. Um, that's huge before activities just to kind of see where everyone's at and allowing them to just be very, you know, it's rough and just leave it at that. That's absolutely wonderful. And then, as you said, it definitely then creates the environment where everyone kind of knows where everyone's at to know, you know, if they're kind of grumpy that day, you know what, they are prob they probably are going through something and that's okay. You know, they, they can be grumpy. And so we give each other kind of some support as you move through it. Um, and I love the fact that you said in staff and volunteers check in too, so that youth understand that adults aren't always living perfect lives either. That's perfect because I, I know my life, I deal with a lot, a lot of stress, a lot of, I've run into adversity, especially, um, being a lesbian in the community that I live in and, you know, we're, we're not all perfect. We all have things to deal with. So, Ooh, Allison, that's wonderful. I love that. The mantra being that they aren't giving me a hard time, they're having a hard time. That's wonderful. I will definitely keep that one in mind. That's perfect. It's a great description. And Laura's nurture optimism. And the reason that I the reason that I say that is because sometimes we have to pay attention to our own attitude when we are um, with the youth. Uh, I have seen sometimes negative uh, people be negative when that is the least that they need at that moment. You know, it's having hope and confidence and, and you know, acknowledge their present, but also uh, thinking about future outcomes. Thank you. And yes, Peter, definitely adding that component that just being a, kind of aware of how people are acting. It's not necessarily always just acting out. It could be, very much be being quiet. <laughs> and I like that too, where by you sharing that you've had a bad day, and it's also kind of helped others Kind of give you kind of check in with each other and they say hey just having a rough day let's not give her a hard time <laughs> i like that is there anything else also to this is can also just be an open conversation i know that we have a lot of professionals in here who know about aces and have actually taught and you know really dug into some of this so if you guys have anything you would like to share um any you know experts or not expertise I'm trying to think of the word right now but anything that you would like to share please do it's an open conversation Joanne and I are no we are not experts nor will I ever be an expert on this topic um, so feel free to share too
Okay, so I'll just move on to the next thing, but still the floor is open, so feel free to jump in at any time. I just wanted to share a couple of resources. This specifically ties into adverse childhood experiences and resilience, not necessarily specifically for LGBTQ youth, um, but it's something that I have found very helpful in my role as a professional. Um, highly recommend Dr. Ginsburg's book, Building Resilience in Children and Teens. It is, it, he looks at things in two different ways. Um, it targets primarily parents. This is a great resource for parents. However, as a professional, um, it gives us a really good perspective on um, things that we can be doing when we're not necessarily in the youth's life 24 seven. Um, so there's some great ways, great information on a, how to help build kind of that resilience in our, our youth. Also another resource, this is really tied to ACEs and it's a huge community. It's called PACES Connection. Um, they just recently added the P to positive. So it's positive and adverse childhood experiences. Um, but you can find the resource at acesconnection.com. And many of you again, who, have, who are aware of ACEs may already be a part of this, these groups. Um, but there's multiple communities focusing on all aspects of adverse childhood experiences. And there's one specific community, the Rainbow Resilience Connection of LGBTQ plus survivors. And this one, even though it sounds like it's specifically for the LGBT, if you are a member of the LGBTQ population, um, this is also for anyone who is an ally too. So don't just think that you have to be a member of the community, but it also, as long as you're an ally to help support, which we all are, and um, this could, is a great community to jump into. Also, there's a lot of webinars and blogs that tie to multiple different topics, um, multiple different uh, populations. And then same with, they do have a lot of specific information um, for the LGBTQ plus population. So I just wanted to share a couple of those um, resources. Jess, I want to add, um, I sat in on Sloan's presentation today, and she shared a really good um, resource for parents and others who are dealing with a whole um, religious um, non-acceptance of LGBTQ, and it's called QueerGrace.com. I haven't had a chance to explore it, but it came highly recommended from Sloan. It's called QueerGrace.com. Wonderful. And so we'll leave it open for questions or again, um, if you're experienced in the field, please share you know, anything that would benefit the group. Um, and also Mark, thank you for sharing that you gave youth space to kind of process um, George Floyd's murder and kind of going through all of that. And I think that's a huge component and that's also very much involved in having what we would call a trauma-informed organization is to allow processing um, with everything that's going on, so. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for getting the exact link. And last but not least, I'll share my contact info just because I am tied to a land grant university. If you would like to ask a question directly to Joanne's brain, feel free to send it to me and I'll send it her way. Um, since she is a professor, whatever the word is, I can't ever think of and she's- Amaritis. Thank Emma. you. And she's retired Emma. from the university. She does not have her university account anymore. So it would be a personal email address, um, but I definitely can get her the information. So again, thank you all for joining us. If you wanna stay on, you've got any questions or anything to share, please do. Um, otherwise we will end uh, just a few minutes early and you guys can get ready for other sessions. So thank you all for attending. And we greatly appreciate your attendance, especially for those of you who are sitting past that work hour. <laughs> Oh, it's great to see you all here. So thank you all. Again, we'll stay on if there's any questions and otherwise have a great afternoon or evening. And Joan and Jessica, 
uh, I would really like to encourage you to post this um, on the document share. I know that there's a lot of people who wanted to be here today, but they're in the other session. And um, so please post it because this is amazing information. And thank you so much for, for doing this for all of us. And I'll make sure that it does get shared. And I will also include the specific link to the clip that we shared since we started just a little bit in on that. Wonderful. Thank you so much.